Welcome to Training Unleashed, the show that will help you design and deliver training that's off the chain and will make a difference. Now, here's your host, Evan Hackle. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting edition of Training Unleashed. I got a great guest with me, Christopher Underbach. He is a Wall Street Journal bestselling author. And I, and I want to tell you, I have bestselling authors on here all the time that are Amazon bestselling authors. I'm an Amazon bestselling author, and it doesn't mean much compared to being a Wall Street Journal. That is a coveted thing. Uh, he is a leadership expert and a former global CEO of a $200 million technology company. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge my sponsors, C-Suite TV and C-Suite Radio. Without them, I wouldn't have a show. Of course, I wouldn't have a show without listeners. Um, I've got an interesting question for you. And you know, to me, something I like truly believe in. You say, change your words, change your, and then you have a blank. What do you mean by that? Well, it really started with, you know, I started down this path, you know, as a former CEO to kind of write a book that I wanted to really have a book about communication that could cross over into leadership in the context of business, but also leadership in the context of relationships as a father, a parent, you know, marriage or whatever. And, uh, and so a lot of times when we're really frustrated by people, whether it's somebody at work or somebody in our personal life, is we think we need to change the person. And what I realized on the kind of four-year journey that I went on researching this book is it's actually just as simple as we don't need to change people. If we change our words, then the people will follow. So change your words, change your relationships, change your words, change your results, change your words, change your leadership. It's really, you know, change your team, change your words. And that for me as a former CEO and somebody who's led teams even with my own self, I was like, oh, well, I'm not as emotionally intelligent as I'd like to be. And like, it always felt like it was a personality trait that I was trying to change within myself or with, within others about organization or whatever it may be. And I found my belief is that now, after all the research I've done, is that 80% of it is we can get most of the way there simply by changing our words. And sometimes that's the words that we speak to ourselves. Well, I, I totally believe you. Um, I know that how I speak to myself in particular, just changing things from I have to do it to I get to do it makes it, uh, it makes a big difference. But let's shift a little bit to others. And can you share some examples of how you change your word changes how people react and work with you? I would say one of the ones that's most common uh, that in the book that people tend to refer to is uh, we talk about on a scale of one to 10. And we talk about how to, I, I say it's how to have difficult conversations the easy way. And the tool is, you know, in the past, let's say if I'm a boss, I say, how do you, you know, do you think we have good communication here at work? And, you know, that's kind of a yes, no question. And ultimately given, you know, is there really any other right answer other than yes, if I ask questions like that? But on the other side, if I can say on a scale of one to 10, how do you, how, how strong do you think our communication is here at work? And what we're going to do, the next part is to exaggerate the scale. So 10 is we have better communication than anyone you've ever communicated with in your entire life at work, outside of work, better than the movies, whatever. And one yeah. is our communication is by the same thing, worse than the movies, worse than anyone. Now, what that does is it really opens up the scale for honesty. Someone can say seven on that scale and it still doesn't feel so bad. Now, the reality is, is when someone says seven on that scale, it probably still means that there's quite a bit of improvement because they're not really judging on like best in the world, right? But it does open up a new conversation. And then we have the follow-up question that we can ask is, so what's the difference between a seven and a nine for you? What could I start doing or stop doing that might get us closer from a seven to a nine? And so that's really the, you know, one of the most common tools in the book that people come back to you. Often I have people, they use it with their children and they talk about how even young kids, they have totally different conversations about school and what their interests are. And by the same token, you know, in marriages and relationships, it, it's a way to really create honest conversations. And I, my belief as a leader, both in personal and professional life is if we don't really know what the other person is feeling needs to be improved, then how do we actually improve? Yeah. Well, I, I really 
like what you're saying when you ask them to put context to their answer, because what I think and what someone else thinks are very different. And we tend to assume that other people think the way we do. And, and we know that's not the case. Um, so if we could take this conversation and shift it into company leadership mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm working, I work at a company, I, I lead people, uh, I, you know, work with, cl you know, clients, things of that nature. Um, what are some practical ideas on how you, how you can use your words to be more effective in that, in that realm? Well, I think another one that I think as leaders, we often, uh, we were talking about really how we make commitments to other people. Uh, there's a tool that I talk about in the book. Uh, it's towards the end of the book, but it's about, you know, often we make commitments like, hey, I'll get that to you next week or, you know, next Wednesday or next Thursday. And the more specific that we can be with our commitments, if I say, Evan, I'll get that to you by Wednesday at 12 p.m. Central Time. That is such a specific commitment that you know, imagine that could be with a client, it could be with a boss, it could be with a coworker. It creates a couple different things. One, if at Wednesday at 12 p.m. Central Time, if it's 12.05, if I didn't put a reminder in my own calendar, it's more likely that I'm going to have like a subconscious, like, what, why did I, I feel like I said some to someone that I'm going to get them something today at, you know, noon or whatever. But then the second thing, as a leader or as a client, if I call you at 12.05 p.m. and say, hey, what, that thing that you said you were going to get to me, you know, the project or the report, it's okay. Whereas if I say, I'll get it to you on Wednesday, and then the leader's kind of sitting there like, you know, like, well, was that noon? Was that one o'clock? Was it three o'clock? And then if I do call you at 12.05, he's like, ah, what, what are you, a micromanager? You, you know, I told you I'd get it to you on Wednesday. So I think that this is something that if I imagine when I was CEO of everyone in our organization made commitments that way, how much less drama would there be around, you know, being micromanaged? But I think sometimes employees also create that micromanagement because they're not specific with their commitments. And then somebody who's like really, you know, really needs something on Wednesday morning and they're following up at 9 a.m. when I'm thinking, oh, it was Wednesday at 5 p.m. is when I was going to get it to you. And so I think that, you know, that's one of the things we're making practical commitments. And then it also, the more specific we are, it's more likely that we're going to follow through on those commitments as we made them, right? Yeah. So I used to always say as a leader, you know, in my company, if you do make a commitment, then as soon as you know, you're not going to be able to meet that commitment, then it's your responsibility to say, hey, I'm not going to meet and let me renegotiate and give you a new date and time uh, at which I'm going to meet my commitment. You know, one of my philosophies in leadership is if I had to choose be, between asking you, can you please do this by one o'clock on Wednesday or asking you, when can you commit? And you say, I'm going to get it done at one o'clock on, on Wednesday. If you say it, it's your commitment. If I say it, it's my commitment. And then they're going to think if they don't make it, that I was unfair and asking for it in that time frame. Yeah. But when they ask for it and define that, when they define the time frame, now they're in ownership. And that is another thing that we cover in the book is like, I always compared to how I would have led five or 10 years ago. Now I say, well, when, when could you get that? I do request that the commitments are in specific terms, like down to a time so that we don't have any drama over you said this. And I thought it was that. Um, but then that there's nothing that stops me from, if someone says, I'll get it to you by Friday at 1 PM, there's nothing that stops me from saying, well, I really actually, I was kind of thinking I need it by Thursday at 8 AM. So Ultimately, the same thing from a leader's perspective, I can still request that they move it up earlier. We can have a conversation about what do I need to move something off your plate? Are there some other priorities that need to be shifted around in order to get that by eight o'clock? But I 100% agree with you by asking someone to make their commitment first. And who knows, sometimes people will surprise us. We'll say, they'll say, hey, I'm going to get that to you by, you know, maybe a week earlier than we thought. And then there's a different conversation, which is, Oh, no, no, it's not that important. So I know some of the other things on your plate are actually more important than this. So getting that to me by tomorrow or, you know, whatever they commit to, we can actually talk about a different, a different commitment date. <laughs> Just to tell you on this story, when I was younger, I mean, really younger, I was talking to a sales rep 
who was calling on my account and I left him a message, uh, you know, on his, you know, the, uh, what the message device that used to be in the home. And I go, Jerry, it's really important. I need to talk to you at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. He left, lived three and a half hours away. And I get to work at eight o'clock in the morning and he's there physically. And I didn't say I, I phone would have been fine. <laughs> now I suspect, cause he's never said it. I suspect he needed to be in the area anyhow. And he was trying to make, make score points. <laughs> but I'm like, I had this guilty feeling. Like I made this man get up at four in the morning to drive to see me. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I, because I wasn't clear. Um, so your book is 22 Talk Shifts. Did I get that name right? Yeah. And does that mean you have like 22 key points or what, what is the, what's the title of the book mean? Yeah, there's, there's 22 short chapters um, and each chapter is a different you know, tool. So a talk shift, the way we define it is it's a simple fill in the blanks phrase or question or a provocative exercise that can shift communication or perspective between two people, whether it's at work or at home. And many of them, I'd say probably about 12 to 13 of them, uh, the language could be used just as well with employees and bosses and children and spouses. We really see that many of these are quite universal. Um, and so there are some around employee engagement, uh, how to lead, uh, lead people to their solutions, not yours, um, criticism, encouragement, emotional intelligence, kind of what I felt as a leader, uh, many of the things that I had read so many books about, but I just like, yeah, emotional intelligence was a great example. I didn't, I'd read all these books, but I wasn't necessarily getting any more emotionally intelligent until I actually had sentence stems of how to speak in a more emotionally intelligent way. And, uh, and so that was really the gap that I was trying to fill. Yeah, it sounds to me, because I've read many a book, where I read the book, and yeah, yeah, I like it, 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 but I have like no idea how to do it. Mm -hmm. that your book is the exact opposite. Well, people are going to like it still, <laughs> but, but they're going to leave with nuggets of things they can try. And yeah, every, every book has a very specific section of here is the talk shift. And it is here's typically it's somewhere between three and five specific sentences or phrases or questions to execute that specific uh, tool. Yeah, which is cool. I also know you have a very unusual way that people can utilize your book and particularly could be very supportive of our, you know, people in the corporate world corporate that training. are listening yeah. to us now. Yeah. I had, so I, I ran a relative, well, I guess it was a small company when I started, it was like 10, 10 employees, about 250 when I, and we, we wanted to invest more in training. My shareholders were not on board with it. So we were always looking for really affordable ways, but I remember I would always read books and it would be like, oh, well, let me get the whole team reading a book, right? And well, it's got to be, you got to really think like 80% of the tools in this book are going to be applied to 50% of the people to do that. And sometimes we just read a book and we're like, huh, you know what? I, I think Evan would benefit so much from chapter nine, but he, I, he's not going to read a book or maybe the other chapters don't apply to him. So we did something that I think is really unique. We, we were one of the first, we created a video book. And we did it with the specific, well, there are two purposes. One, you get more, as you know, as a training company, you get more recall if you, know, you have visuals as long as audio and whatever. But the other thing in a corporate environment was you can, if you have the video book, you can actually take a specific chapter and you could share that one chapter by email. Uh, so one chapter that has been requested a lot to be chapter, uh, to be shared uh, anonymously is one of the chapters, chapter nine is about micromanagement. So we do get people on Facebook saying, hey, can I share this with my boss anonymously? <laughs> we, we don't recommend as part of our philosophy, passive aggressive or anonymous, you know, we, we, we recommend more direct communication, but the reality is, is that some people do use it in that way. Um, but so that's really also one of the things that we found is, is, to get people to engage, to practice these shifts, it's usually better to have someone that you're, you, you know, you're working as a practice partner. Uh, I have a story that I tell on the website about, um, you know, I, I wrote the book and then about, it was about six months ago, I was talking with my wife and she said, do you think I'm slow? And I said, ooh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna touch that one with a tempo pole, tempo pole after like a couple of glasses of wine on a Friday night. But the next day I circled back and I said, what do you mean? 
She goes, well, you ask me, does that make sense a lot? I said, oh, yeah, you know, I was 22. One of my mentors said, hey, you're in IT. Just ask, does that make sense? So it became this habit. Uh, interesting, we were just talking about this today. She said, you don't, you don't say that anymore. Because what we did is we said, okay, let's make a little game out of it. This is actually one of the talk shifts, by the way. Uh, but we made a little game and she would, every time I'd say, does that make sense? She'd say, yes, Christopher, that does make sense. <laughs> and she, I said, oh, even better to break the habit, count it off. So one, two, three, within three days, we were at 39. I mean, I was literally 20 times a day. Wow. I'm saying, does that make sense? Um, and so we just had a good laugh about it. And then the interesting thing was if I hadn't broken that habit and then also made it clear that it was just a habit that some mentor had told me when I was 22, 23 years old, when I first entered the workforce, she was starting to think that I thought she was slow <laughs> because and the, all it was, was just a communication habit. So I had no idea how frequently I said that. And when I observe other people getting into these talk shifts is, a lot of us have communication patterns that have been ingrained and will have a similar experience of learning within the first couple of days. Like, oh, wow, I had no idea how much I do that. And so the ability of having this kind of way of introducing tools to coworkers without having to read, you know, the book is relatively short. It's like a four hour read, but some people don't like to read. They would much prefer an eight minute video. Well, I, I always, you know, I'm reading a book, I'm watching a movie, I'm seeing something on the news, I, I always am sitting back and saying, I wish somebody else would watch this. Yeah. If I could just get them to watch this, they would kind of get it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I like how you're, um, how you're really using the book and allowing people to use it in certain ways. I, I like reading books with my team. I like it a lot. I'm not sure my team really likes it. Um, and we actually have a, this, our podcast is part of what we do. We also have a book club mm -hmm. where people go online and, and participate in the book club. Uh, and it's uh, interesting because it used to see the same people that participate in the book club. Cause there's some people, you know, I probably read one or two books a month on business. I really enjoy doing it but not everyone else is like me. So I like the idea that you could take a point and break it down into seven or nine minutes and, and share that and have a conversation on that, as opposed to making people read a whole book. Well, uh, it's also as leaders. I mean, we like, I would love to see the Venn diagram of people who like to read and people who like Evan to know that they read the book. Because <laughs> you know, I, I used to do the same thing as a boss. And I was like, I, I you know, the, a lot of people wouldn't read the books, but you know, there were some people who just wanted to be good, good corporate citizens and let them let the CEO know that they're reading. But on the other side is, and this happens with corporate training people is every minute that someone's in training is not a minute that they're not working, right? So we need to balance like giving people enough training so that they can be more effective, but also recognizing that training is the time cost of training is significant as well. So if you can take a book and say, hey, here's the five chapters that are most relevant to our customer service team. And here's the five chapters that are most relevant to our sales team and to our leaders and whatever. Now, that's a much more effective way to disseminate the tools around an organization than necessarily um, well, you know, everybody you, read all 22 of these talk shifts. For example. Now you, br you bring up a, a really good point. When you ask everybody to do something and it only applies to a third or, you know, think of the, the corporate time and waste. And I think about like corporate, uh, um, what's the word, forums, discussion forums. And when they first came out, this is like unbelievable. I have a question I ask, somebody in the company is going to know. And, you know, at the time these things were all hot, I worked in an organization where between all the franchisees, co-op members, corporate, et cetera, there literally was probably about 80 or 90,000 people. Mm -hmm. Now think about it for a second. If you posed a question that went to 80 or 90,000 people, think of the cost of that question in terms of the value of the time. Because oh, yeah. if it took one minute to read it and all 80,000 people read it, it's 80,000 minutes oh, yeah. for a simple question. Um, and when you start thinking about things that way, it really... It, it, it makes you it makes you think differently. So dividing up, but well, I, th I think there's also as a leader, you know, 
and I'm, I'll just use this, whether it's any training program as a leader, like my book has 22 chapters. Well, you may look at it and say, these are the five that are most interesting to my organization. And you as the leader saying, these are the five that I'm selecting that I would like for you to read. It sends a message to the team versus read this whole book. And then you draw what conclusions you want about what are the things that are most important. Like we're kind of like, we're letting go of a little bit of the potentially watering down the message of what we want to improve when we just say, hey, watch this whole thing. So I want to ask what I think is the most important question of the interview. Uh, I'm giving this question a little bit of hype because it is fundamental to the concept of Training Unleashed, which is the whole idea that we're training champions and we're here to advocate for training because we believe that effective training has a huge change in the company. And, you know, you're change your words, change your blank. And a lot of times, and certainly listeners to this show get frustrated because senior management doesn't take training seriously enough. It's an afterthought. It's underfunded. So what advice could you give to the people, to our listeners, to get senior management to listen to them better? How can they change their words? How can they be more effective to get buy-in and support for training initiatives? I think the more that we can, we know that tools will create practical value. Like, you know, I've, I've been to leadership courses and I walked out and said, I spent three days and I still don't know what I'm going to do differently. I heard a lot of platitudes. So I think the more we can drive things down to learning objectives of people are going to behave differently this way um, and driving that into, sometimes it's also about telling stories, uh, stories that create value. So if it's a customer service training, like what's the value of, you know, not losing a customer? What's the value of having a customer and being able to communicate differently to customers in specific examples? And so I think that there's, I always had this with my own shareholders. I'm a believer in training, but my shareholders were similar, you know, when I was CEO saying, ah, we don't believe in training. They frankly didn't believe in HR at all. Uh, so we had to, one of the reasons why I'm no longer CEO there, uh, but, uh, and the challenge is always with training is how do you communicate the value and also how quickly you're going to recoup that value. Um, so cost of so, employee. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is instead of talking about what the training is, talk about what the training does and do it with stories that can create pictures in people's minds of this is the shift we're going to create. Yeah. Using that, real examples. And then I do think come back, come back to our earlier point is recognizing that one of the biggest costs of training is the time that people spend in training. So the more we can optimize how much time they spend, uh, maximize the value for the minimum amount of time spent in training, that is the way. And, and I think that as you work through, if you do have an organization that's having difficulties, you know, buying into doing training, start small, you know, show value collect stories. This person went through this training and then we, we found here's a real customer that we saved or a real customer that, you know, bought more because of that training and then use those anecdotal evidence um, in the absence of, you know, real quantifiable evidence across all the people being trained, which is very difficult, as you know, to actually draw directly. Well, action. and I do think that's one of the frustrations is defining an ROI for training is sometimes difficult. Because your ROI isn't necessarily just in business results. Uh, training can improve retention of employees. Training can be something that, that draws people there. GE uh, used to be known for their training. They had a whole university. And I have no doubt that many, many people chose to work for GE because they wanted to go to their corporate university. They wanted that, that education. Um, so there are so many intangibles when companies become training organizations. Um, well, I think that if you go to the executives as well and you say, what are the problems you're trying to solve? And we frame the training as one of the ways to solve some of those problems. Then it's also, because I think sometimes we look at, oh, we need leadership training or we need whatever. And if the executives are not talking about needing leadership training, they're saying, hey, we have a turnover problem then package training as a solution to a turnover problem, not something generic, a generic initiative. 
Yeah. So I have it really focusing on the key company initiatives or the key things the company is work, working with, yeah. and, and, and which is also important, I think, for training to have a seat at the top, not like the CEO top, but you know, a seat in senior management where there is somebody there that's really understands training and really advocating for training. Uh, because when you don't have that, the, the communication really, really drops. Yeah, I, I actually wrote an article some time ago. It was, it was about the cost of, so we were a quickly growing organization. And because we didn't invest in training, we ended up having to hire people from the outside. And I think I, I ran the numbers. I was like, for, you know, to hire a $200,000 executive from the outside, I think the, the, the real cost of that is probably close to a million dollars. When you take the fact that probably only one out of three executives actually work out. Yep. And then for the one or two that don't work out, you end up losing some of your key staff, probably the ones who are closest to being able to get that, get that role. So you often end up losing the best person on the team, which then creates it even makes it even harder for someone from the outside to actually succeed. So, uh, and ultimately it was all because we were not investing sufficiently in training to grow our people uh, so much so that we actually had some people over time, we're like, you know, what? it'll actually be, I'll be better off getting an executive job at this company. If I go to another company, get training there and then come back in three to four years. Um, so, you know, so. it's interesting you say that I, I was in the floor covering business. We had thousands of floor covering stores that the old company I work with. And there was a time where you would hire someone from another floor covering store, because if you hired someone who was green, the amount of time it took to train them on product was so long, it took so long to be productive. So what we found was that people were hiring people a new product more than they were hiring people that were really great in selling. Mm -hmm. So if you want to hire a really great salesperson in floor covering, you need to hire someone that has great interpersonal skills, really understands fashion, can talk intelligently with the customer about fashion, but they, they absolutely have to know what floor covering is and they have to know at what rooms, what times, all these things. So we mm -hmm. invested in a massive amount of product training. Yeah. And at the time, because the story goes back, it was video, it was video based leader book, et cetera, but it enabled us to stop hiring people from the floor covering industry, enable us to hire people that had true selling skills, the best person to be a salesperson, because we had the tools to which to provide the product knowledge. Yeah. And, and interestingly enough, one of the biggest things we found was these people we were hired trained by somebody else were not necessarily properly trained yeah. and, and had bad ideas in terms of what were the right products and the right things? So when I, when I was CEO, well, my challenge was really around leadership training and what we had. And, and I think I've heard some of this that around millennials is there were so many great people and we were a lot of engineers. They're like, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to ever be a manager. I just want to be an engineer. And yet often the best engineering managers are the, you know, they're engineers who have learned how to, you know, build those leadership skills. And I think it was also because we didn't invest enough in training, we had some number of engineers who grew to be really bad managers. And so then all the other ones were like, I don't want to do that because there's that person who was a great engineer who's a really bad manager that everyone's complaining about. Well, the challenge was we weren't giving them the skills and you know helping them to actually be good at that new skill set. And so ultimately, then we, again, we kind of end up in the situation having to bring people from the outside. And, and that was a little bit different because then those people didn't have the respect because they didn't actually understand the product, right? So right. Um, I think it is one of those things that ultimately product training is probably one that companies are most, uh, leaders are most comfortable with. Um, and then I think leadership training is probably one, my, my sense is some, sometimes it's one that's hardest to really kind of get a sense. But it's really a shame that, you know, one leader potentially is controlling a payroll of, a million dollars, you know, if somebody's got 10 or 15 engineers in, in today's just, world, it's a lot more than a million dollars. Yeah. yeah. So if you take all the benefits, uh, you know, even a team of seven engineers, at least is going to be a million dollars. Yet if somebody's controlling a million dollars of payroll, we won't spend $5,000 per year for the leader to actually be an effective 
So maybe what we need to be doing, coming back to your question about how to convince leaders to invest in training is to say, especially leadership training, maybe we should invest a certain percentage of the total payroll underneath that person's responsibility and say, hey, here's somebody who's managing a $20 million payroll. Maybe $10,000 to get them some skills to do it effectively is, is, a, pretty good, is a pretty good investment. I, I actually like that to look at the cost versus the span of control. Yeah. You know, here's the value of what this person's managing. I, I like that a lot. I, and, in, you know, back when I was full-time in training and floor covering, one of the biggest things we could do is raise margin. You could demonstrate proper training could raise margin by four or five, six points. So we kept on building a theme. First off, we had a theme for our training department, which was profit from the experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we're constantly trying to reiterate that training was about being profitable. Absolutely. But also the idea of 1% for training. That was in all our communication. One, you know, budget 1% of sales for training, 1% for training, 1% for training. And, and that, that, did that did have a pretty, a pretty big impact. Yeah, you know, we used to try to work on getting our you know percentage of salary uh, for training, um, which I think is uh, is another good way to look at it. Um, yeah, the, it's, it's it's a very similar thing because if you it, your salaries are a percentage of your sales, percentage of that is a percentage of your sales too. It's just a matter of how of how you how you look at it. Uh, it you know, I definitely can see your example of a a sale a manager of an engineering team to really have to understand the engineering really well because they aren't going to be respected, nor are they going to be able to understand how to manage. You know, going back to floor covering, everybody who sold floor covering wanted to be a manager. That was their dream, quite the opposite of your experience. Mm -hmm. The problem is the skill set was totally different and completely foreign. So just because they were a great salesperson, generally speaking, made them a terrible manager. Yeah. Uh, but it was amazing because a lot of, I think, being a great salesperson is you have an ego, right? You think you can do just about anything and et cetera. And you go, and they go, well, I want to be a sales manager. Okay. I, are you willing to take a 50% pay cut to become one? Because that's what a manager earns. That's a really top salesperson, maybe a top salesperson earns a lot more than a manager. Yeah. And uh, that, that sometimes helps. Uh, we are, we could talk forever, but we're running out of time. You know, we're talking about your book, and I am sure that people here are interested in your book. They're interested in your video book. But I think people also like to know what your company does, who are your ideal customers. So, you know, this is your opportunity to let everyone know about your company and how to reach you and all those good things. Uh, so, well, I guess technically my company is, uh, we're, we're a foundation. Um, I, when I retired, I, I sold my company for uh, enough that I don't necessarily do writing books. Uh, it's really more about having an impact on the world. Our mission is to change the words of the world, and we give 100% of our profits back to initiatives that will help us to change the words of the world. I take no salary, so it, this is really just about truly changing the words of the world. Um, our, it's called the Global Talk Shift Movement, uh, or the Global Talk Shift Foundation is the nonprofit arm. Uh, we are a for-profit company, but we give all of our profits away because I do believe that a for-profit model is still a, great, a better way to change the words of the world than purely through nonprofit. Um, purchasing the video book and the other tools that we have can all be done at talkshift.com. Um, we give away the book uh, as our gift. People just pay for shipping and printing of the book. Uh, and then after you get the free copy of the hardcover um, or our gift copy of the hardcover, then you can add the video book or audio book or all the other things. Uh, if you if you don't like gift copies, you can you can buy it for twice as much money on Amazon and give the give the profits to Jeff Bezos. So, um, but uh, he has a charity all owns to himself. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know what he's going to be doing to change the words of the world, uh, but uh, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, we've had just great success with the book so far. We, as you mentioned, we had number one on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list earlier this year, and we're starting to work on some of our next uh, series of books around leadership and relationships and communication in general. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you talk about the importance of being a for-profit company. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with nonprofit organizations and I try to instill the culture of running the business as if it was a for-profit organization. Yeah. And that when you think about, you know, how are you being effective? How are you 
maximizing the value of your assets, all of these things, it shifts completely how you run, how you run a business and you can maximize your results far better than if everything you're doing, you look at as it's just a charitable thing. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say, if I'm hearing this correctly, is I can go spend like pennies for you to send me a, a copy of the book. You know, you pay for the printing and the shipping, super cheap. Then I get access to the videos and then I can start using those videos with my team at work. Yeah. And we do have, we have, we have packages also on the website uh, where you can you basically buy 10 copies of the book if you want to, you know, and you get the video book, the audio book. The whole point is that some people like to read, some people like to watch videos, some people like to, you know, some people like to listen to audio books while they're at the gym or walking, whatever. We want to give you the tools where you just pay one fee and then, you know, give, give the tools to people in whatever format they prefer to consume it uh, and take away the excuses of, eh, I'm not really a book person or whatever it may be. Well, I have to say, I have a lot of guests on the show. You, you seem to have one of the, the lowest uh, profit motives <laughs> because you're really looking to spread the word, which is, which is awesome. I think it's, it's great. I know because you know, we generally talk about what offer you already shared the, the offer on the, on the, the book. So I'm going to, first off, the website again is talk is talkshift.com or talkshift.com. Yep. Not, not, not 22 talkshift.com. Yeah. Talkshift.com. Uh, top shift. I just want to make sure everyone got it. Cause uh, it's uh, sometimes difficult when listening. I don't have people run back and record. Um, as we end the show, every episode is if you had one tip to share, what would that one tip be? I think the, the, the simplest one is the simplest talk shift is to stop, start all of your questions with the word what or how. And if you observe the questions that others ask and you observe the questions that you ask, you will immediately have better, deeper conversations if you just start all your questions with the word what or how. Hmm. I like that. It's going to take that on for a little while. It's a simple one. We have. It's the simplest of all the 22 talk shifts. It's actually buried in one of the chapters with about five other tools, but um, it's, yeah, it's the simplest example. And I think one of the powers of these talk shifts is you, like with that one, we start to observe not only how our communication can change, but you're in a meeting and you listen to how other people can change their communication. And we can actually learn of, oh, he could have said that this way and it would have made a big difference in the answer he got. So, so I imagine in my book, I start off the book and say, read the whole book fast and then come back and reread it a chapter at a time and do the exercises. So you get the concept and then you come back and do it. I would imagine your book would be somewhat similar where you really don't want to just read the book and be done. You really want to be able to go to each chapter and practice those habits and, and recommendations. Um, which is cool. It sounds like it sounds uh, like a terrific book, one I've definitely got to put on my list. And uh, it's been great to have you as a guest. I want to thank uh, my friends at the C-Suite TV and radio. And most importantly, I want to thank my listeners because without you, I wouldn't have a show. Everyone have a great day. Training Unleashed is brought to you by Total Training, specializing in e-learning and interactive online training solutions for corporate, government, nonprofit, and franchise organizations. Tortal makes effective training easier. Just go to tortal.net to gain access to real-world tools that can make a difference. That's tortal.net, T-O-R-T-A-L, tortal.net.